Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to discuss is something called the class equation. Okay, now in order to discuss the class equation for a group, we firstly need to discuss the conjugacy classes of a group. Okay, and in order to discuss the conjugacy classes of the group, we need to discuss conjugation uh, in a group. Uh, in a bit more detail. Specifically, what I want to study is that you can actually view conjugation as a group action by a group on itself. Okay, so we're firstly going to start off by studying how conjugation can be viewed as a group action uh, of a group on itself. Then what we'll move on to is studying the conjugacy classes, and then finally, uh, studying the conjugacy classes will lead us very naturally to the actual class equation. Okay, right. Uh, so firstly then, let's um, discuss uh, conjugation as a group action of a group on itself. Okay, so firstly, the thing that we're actually going to need in order to discuss all of this is some arbitrary group. So let's start off, as always, just with the basic setup. So we're going to need some group, uh, which we will refer to as capital G. And I'll remind you that this will consist of a set of symbols, which I'll denote like so, along with a composition law defined on this set of symbols. Okay, so for any two symbols within this set, we can compose the two of them together with this composition table that I have over here. Okay, and of course that composition table will need to obey the axioms of group theory in order for this to actually be a group. Okay, so we have our arbitrary group here, which is the set of symbols with this composition law defined on it. Okay, and what we're now going to do is create a group action of this group capital G on itself, and this group action is going to involve conjugation. Okay, so we're going to create a group action, and we know uh, from uh, previous videos in this playlist on group theory that a group action can be interpreted as a composition table involving all of the elements of the group and all of the elements of the set on which the group is going to act. Now in this case, the set on which the group is actually going to act, which we usually denote capital A, is actually going to be an exact replica of this set of symbols of the group here. Okay, so A is going to equal G, it's going to be an exact replica of this set of symbols here. Okay, so you copy the set of symbols and this is the set on which the elements of the group are going to act. Okay, now colour this one in in turquoise here. Okay, so back to our group action composition table then. So here is going to be our group action composition table. So what we're going to do is we're going to put all of the elements of our group down here. So we're going to give absolutely every element of the group a row in the group action composition table here. And these will be the elements of the group that is actually the group here. So the group in red. So the set of symbols with the composition law defined on it. Rather than the group over here which is just being viewed as a set of symbols. Okay? And then what we'll do is we'll give all the elements of the group also a column over here, but here you are viewing the elements over here as just the symbols from the group, so from this turquoise portion. Okay, so that from this turquoise replica of the set of symbols that underlies the group in red over there. Okay, right, and uh, this then is going to be group action composition, which we usually uh, refer to as dot. Okay, right, so how are we going to then define the entries in this group action composition table? Okay, well, we're going to define little g dot little a, where little g comes from our group in red here, so it's we're taking the row corresponding to little g, and little a here comes from our uh, group over here, where we're just viewing the elements of this as being the uh, set rather than the set with the composition law. Okay, uh, so you take some little a here and you'll take, of course, the column dedicated to that element little a. The way we're going to define g dot little a is going to be as the g conjugate of the element little a. So we're going to define it to be equal to g a g inverse, where all of the compositions here are composition in the actual group composition table over here. 
Okay, so I haven't actually spelled out the composition symbols here. I could have stuck in a composition symbol in between G and A here, and a composition symbol in between A and G inverse here, but I haven't done that. I've just uh, put them next to each other, and that denotes composition in the group. Okay, so all of the compositions here are compositions in the group. So quite simply, what I'm going to take is if I have any element of my uh, group uh, over here, so any little a from my group here, and I want to act the element little g on it, all I'm going to send it to is the little g conjugate of the element little a, okay, in the group composition table over here. Okay, right. Uh, so this is looking hopeful that it could be a group action, because after all, all of the answers that we're now going to put in this composition table for the group action are actually going to be from the set capital G again, because the answer here will always be back in the group capital G, so all of the answers here will be in our set capital G up here. Okay, so it's looking hopeful that it could potentially be a group action. Okay, what we now want to uh, show is that in fact it does actually obey the axioms of a group action. So this composition table that I've just defined, which involves conjugation of the elements of the group by the element little g, uh, I want to prove that this does actually obey the axioms of group actions. Okay, so let's go over the two axioms of group actions. So axiom number one of a group action, what does that say? Okay, so axiom number one of a group action says that no matter what elements of the group you pick, so no matter what little g1 and little g2 you pick from the group capital G, and these are elements from this red portion here, so I'll underline them in red here. Okay, so you pick any g1 and g2 from the group capital G. Also pick me any little a from the group capital G, but of course this will be from the turquoise portion up here, so pick any little a from the group capital G, okay, so for all little g1 and little g2 from the group capital G, and for all little a is an element of the group capital G, uh, it must be the case that if we do g1 dot g2 dot a, so if we firstly act little g2 on the element little a, get some answer that's back in the group, and then act little g1 on that answer, the answer that we overall end up with from doing that must be the same as if we firstly compose little g1 and little g2 together in the group composition table, so here we compose g1 and g2 together in the group composition table, and then we act the composite of these two on the element little a. Okay, so it must be true that the left hand side is equal to the right hand side no matter what little g1, little g2, and little a that you pick from the group. Okay, so that's axiom number one of a group action, so we need to make sure that if we define the entries of the group action composition table here to be this, uh, that it is actually going to obey axiom number one. So quite simply, let's take the left-hand side here, apply our definition, and show that it's equal to the right-hand side. Okay, so uh, we'll start off with g2.a, so we're acting g2 on the element little a. So what that means, by definition, is that we need to conjugate the element little a by g2 in the group capital G. Okay, so we conjugate little a by g2, and all of these compositions will be in the group capital G. So that is what g2 acting on the element little a is going to be equal to. Then what we need to do is act little g1 on this element. Now that's perfectly valid, because of course, when we conjugate little a by g2, we end up with another element of the group. Okay, so we can now act little g1 on that other elements of the group, so what we'll want to do is conjugate this element of the group by little g1, so we we'll want to put little g1 in the front, and then little g1 inverse behind. So the left hand side then of this equation will always be equal to this, little g1, little g2, a, uh, little g2 inverse, little g1 inverse. Okay, now, let's then do uh, the right hand side, that's uh, apply the definition of the group action to the right-hand side here, and show that these two things are always going to be equal to one another. 
Okay, so if we apply the definition of the group action to the right-hand side here, then what we want to do is conjugate the element little a within our group capital G by the element G1 composed with G2. So what we're going to do is we're going to take G1 composed with G2, okay, we'll put A in the middle, and then we'll put G1 composed with G2's inverse on the other side here. Okay, so that, just applying the very definition of what the group action is defined to be, is what G1 composed with G2 acting on this element, little a, is actually going to be equal to. Okay, right. So why is it the case that these two things are always the same? Well, hopefully this should be pretty obvious. All we really need to do is re-express what G1 composed with G2's inverse is actually equal to. And we know that the inverse of two elements of the group composed together like this is actually just going to be G2 inverse composed with G1 inverse. So take the inverse of these two elements that you've got composed together and compose them together, but in the opposite order, basically. That's how you arrive at what the inverse of a composite element is actually going to be equal to. So we can just rewrite G1, G2 inverse as G2 inverse composed with G1 inverse, and then hopefully you can see that that's now exactly equal to this left-hand side here. Okay, all that we've got in here is the brackets in a slightly different place, but of course these are all compositions from the group capital G, so we know that associativity applies and therefore it really does not matter where you put the brackets. The composition of five things has one and only one answer. It does not matter where you put the brackets. So these two things are uh, absolutely equal to one another, and that applies for whatever little g1, whatever little g2, and whatever little a you pick from the group capital G. So we've now proven that if we're going to define this group action by the group capital G on the group capital G as conjugation of all of the elements, uh, of the group capital G by uh, the element little g, okay, that it actually is going to obey axiom number one of a group action. Okay, so now let's check that it will obey axiom number two of a group action. So what does axiom number two then of a group action actually say? Okay, so axiom number two regards the identity element of the group. Okay, and it says that the identity element must act on any element of the set, so any little a in the group in this case, and give little a back again. So this must be true for all little a is in our set capital G. Okay, so this is axiom number two then of group actions, that the identity must act on any element of the set to give back that element of the set. Okay, so just applying the very definition of what uh, it, uh, acting on an element actually means, the identity acting on any element little a means the identity conjugating little a. So the identity a, and then we'll want the identity inverse. Okay, but the inverse of the identity element is just the identity element. So this just becomes uh, the identity a, the identity. Okay, and of course that's just equal to little a because when you compose the identity with a here, you'll get little a, and then when you compose little a with the identity on the other side, again, you'll get little a back again. So this will always equal little a, no matter what little a we're talking about. So whenever you conjugate any element of the group by the identity element in the group, you end up with that same element of the group back again. Okay, uh, so indeed, this second axiom of group actions is actually satisfied because the identity element does conjugate any element of the group trivially, basically. It sends any element of the group to itself. Okay, right, so we've now shown then that this actually does obey the axioms of a group action. So if we define uh, little g acting on little a to equal the little g conjugate of little a in the group capital G, this group action composition table that we'll get is actually a group action. Okay, now that tells us something very deep about conjugation of the elements of the group um, by another element of the group. Okay, because remember, whenever you have a group action composition table, what does that actually do? Okay, well, the whole motivation for defining group actions is that we are trying to associate the elements of the group with set permutations of the set on which the group is acting. Okay, so what this tells us 
is that you can associate with every element of the group capital G a set permutation of the set capital G uh, which involves sending all elements of the group to what they are conjugated by that element little g. Okay, so what we now know is that for all little g in the group, what we can do is associate a set permutation which I'll call sigma little g, which is going to map the elements of the group onto themselves. Okay, and the way this is going to work is it's going to take any element of the group little a, and it's going to take it onto the little g conjugate of little a. Okay, and we know because this actually obeys the axioms of a group action that this now is actually going to be a set permutation. Okay, so for whatever little g you have in the group, this map which sends all the elements of the group to what uh, their little g conjugate is, is always going to be a set permutation. And what is more, uh, these set permutations that you can associate with the elements of the group in this way are actually going to be consistent uh, with the group composition law. Okay, so it's going to be the case that if you have two elements of the group uh, and you compose them together in the group composition law, that the answer will be consistent with what you would get if you compose the two set permutations that are associated with them, i.e. the answer of G1 composed with G2 in our group composition law, the set permutation associated with that element would be the same set permutation as you'd get if you composed the set permutation associated with G1 with the set permutation associated with G2. Okay, so the group composition law is going to be uh, consistent with the composition of the set permutations that we've now associated with all of the elements of the group. Okay, so we've seen uh, already in the video on group actions and previously uh, in the video on Cayley's theorem that you can always associate with all of the elements of a group uh, set permutations of the elements of the group uh, through left multiplication, but now we've got another way of doing it through conjugation. Okay, so this is a new nice way of associating with all of the elements of the group a set permutation of the elements of the group. Okay, and this set permutation is going to be consistent with the composition law on the group. Okay, and this is a very, very powerful concept. Okay, now, before we have a break, uh, what I'd like to say is one more thing about this group action of a group on itself by conjugation, which regards what happens if the group capital G is abelian, because if the group capital G is abelian, this all becomes rather trivial. Okay, so let's take the case now that G is abelian. Okay, now I'll just remind you of what it means for a group to be abelian. So if a group is abelian, it means that uh, the composition law is commutative. Okay, so the definition of an abelian group is that whatever little g1 and little g2 that you pick from the group, so take any two elements from the group, you can compose these two elements together in either order and the answer is the same. So G1 composed with G2 in the group composition table is going to be identical to G2 composed with G1 for all that G1 and G2 are elements of the group. Okay, so the group composition table is going to be completely symmetric down the diagonal line if the group is abelian. Okay, now in an abelian group, conjugation becomes rather trivial. Okay, so if we consider uh, little a and little g, which are elements of our abelian group, capital G. So take two elements from your abelian group, one is little a and one is little g, and consider what the little g conjugate of little a is equal to. So little a conjugated by little g, What's this going to equal? Well, what we can just do is commute little g and little a around here, so we can say that this is little a, little g here, okay? And then what we can do is say, okay, now I'll compose little g with little g inverse, because of course associativity applies, so it doesn't matter where you put the brackets, the answer is always the same, so of course I can just cancel the little g with the g inverse, and I'll get that this is equal to little a, okay? And that applies no matter what little a I picked, and what little g I pick, so I can put a for all little a and little g are elements of the group capital G that this applies, that the uh, little g conjugate of the element little a is, is equal to little a. Conjugation has absolutely no effect in an abelian group. It's only an interesting thing to do if you're working in a non-abelian group. Now let's think about what this means for the group action 
of the group capital G on itself by conjugation. What does this mean for this group action composition table here? Okay, so just drawing out the group action composition table again. So we'll have all of the elements of the group here, given the row. Okay, so here they are in red. And all of the elements of the group up here, given a column. Again, I'll colour those ones in, in turquoise up here. Okay, and this is the um, group action composition table, so I'll call it dot here. And basically, if I take an arbitrary element of the group here, an arbitrary row dedicated, let's say, to the element little g, and I consider what little g acting on any of these elements of the group is actually going to do, which well, is just going to send them to themselves, okay? All of the entries here are just going to be the same as the entry above them, the same as the uh, title of the column they're in, basically. So this row is going to be an exact replica of the elements of this group in exactly the same order, basically. Okay, and that's going to be the case no matter what little g you're working with. So all of the elements of the group are just going to have identical rows now in this group action composition table. So this group action composition table is going to be all rather boring. Okay, and what this means is that all the elements of the group are going to actually be associated with the identity set permutation of the group capital G. So the set permutation that sends all the elements of the group onto themselves. Okay, uh, so we know what a group action of this form is called. It's called a trivial group action. Okay, so uh, if you are working in an abelian group, then the group action of a group capital of this group on itself is actually going to be trivial. It's going to be a trivial group action. So this is not an interesting group action to study if you're working in the abelian group. It's only interesting if you're working in the non-abelian group. Okay, right, so that's the basic uh, introduction to how we can view conjugation as uh, a group action of the group capital G on itself. In the next video, what we will move on to is the concept of conjugacy classes, and this relates to the concept of the orbits of this group action of the group capital G on itself by conjugation.